Arise, shine, for your light, your light has come. Because a thick darkness had covered the earth, and only the light of God's revelation could purge it. When Jesus Christ is born, darkness indeed has covered the earth. It has covered it to the degree that the people of God have forgotten about God. They have forgotten about his word. They have forgotten about the pure and correct doctrine of it. They have drifted so far afield from their religion that they don't even know the word of the Lord when they hear it. This metaphorically occurs several times throughout the gospel account, most notably at the cross when Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the crowd says, Here, he is calling for Elijah. They don't actually know the name of God when they hear it, and that's meaningful. There is so much darkness that the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Zealots, all of the chief factions of Judaism are so far afield from the Old Testament religion as to be almost unrecognizable. The government is not in the control of the monarchy, not of the Hasmoneans, no way, shape, or form related to the line of David and Solomon. Instead, Herod is king, and the Romans are dominant in the area. Everything about the world has gone horribly wrong. They have lost in Israel their nationhood, their sovereignty, their independence, their identity as a people and as a religion. They have lost control of their government to foreigners. They are under the domination of the world, and all the various factions are obsessed with fighting one another and fighting these powers in the world to control this lump of darkness. So much so that now, finally, at this moment, at this moment in time of the nativity, the Christ child is born. The very first promise given to humanity after the fall by God Almighty that a descendant of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. The child is born, God in the flesh, the promised Messiah, across ages and millennia, has come into the world, and the people of God don't know it. The people that he called to be his own, from the flood, from Ur, from Egypt, the ones he called back from Babylon, while the ones in the north were destroyed in Assyria, these people that have been God's people, step by step, guided, directed, protected, taught, given prophets to reveal the word of God, of all the people in the world that should have known about the coming of the Christ child, they are all there and none of them knows it. But the Magi know. To the shame and disgrace of the Israelites, the people of Babylon remember the word of the Lord. From that brief glimpse they had of it during the time of the captivity, when great prophets like Ezekiel and Daniel were doing great works, when Habakkuk even is said to have appeared when great miraculous things were happening that shamed the gods of Babylon and made the Babylonians think twice about their life. So much so that the people who rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar swore that he must have become a Jew because he had seen all the things that the God of the Israelites had done. Those people remember the word of the Lord. Daniel was, in a sense, their prophet as well. Daniel's the one that actually gets promoted in Babylon to be in charge of all the astrologers and wizards of the kingdom. A peculiar job, to be sure, for a prophet of God. But it's neat. It's neat because those people in the Babylonian, that group of astrologers and sorcerers, well, they had their own word for it, and it was magi. It's where we get the word magic and magician, still in our language. The magi were the upper-class astrologers of ancient Babylon, and there were many of them. They were the religious class of the Babylonian pagan religion. And yet Daniel, because he can interpret dreams, is made chief of them. Now it's them. They, the descendants of the Magi, new Magi, Magi of Babylon of the first century, who arrive and say, where is the one who is born king of the Jews? We have seen his star. Imagine this. Across the desert in Babylon in some moldy library, dust-covered scrolls being studied by these people descended by many centuries from their ancestors. They know enough of the word of God in those scrolls 
maybe even the book of Daniel. They know enough of it to know that what it signifies is the birth of the Messiah, the Christ. Not entirely clear how much they understand that. In fact, there's a lot of politics going on at the time. The Babylonians are trying to rebuild themselves after some centuries of weakness. They would love to turn the Jewish kingdom against the Romans in a great uprising. And now Herod, who has been their friend, is going to be replaced by a baby born according to the signs of the horoscope. It may well be that there's all sorts of weird motives on behalf of the monarchy in Babylon in sending these magi and all these gifts. But think of it anyway, that these guys knew. They arrived to Jerusalem, Jesus' capital, the place where he should have been born in the palace, the rightful descendant of David and Solomon, the rightful heir to the throne, but he is born in the, well, born in the stable out back and laid in the manger because his own family doesn't seem to have room for him in the house on the property there, the ancestral home of Jesse. Jesus is born into a world that, does, that should have been ready for him but is not, to a people that should have known him but didn't, to a people, as John's Gospel says, he comes into his own, but his own did not know him. He comes to his world that he made, and he's not welcome. He arrives in this universe built by him in eternity and it does not receive him. Rather, it begins immediately to plot his murder and destruction. The people that should have known, the rulers, the teachers of the law, the religious class, the political class, anyone descended of the Israelites who should have known, don't know. But the Magi show up and this is what makes it epiphany. This is what transfers it from just the nativity to the epiphany. <coughs> because now the people who should have known about his coming and did not have not received him, but the Gentiles do. It's one of those indicators prophesied as it is prophesied by Isaiah that all nations would come to his light. The light that pierces the darkness has already planted the seed. He's planted the ember of the fire that will consume the darkness of the world, that will bring to light the gospel of Jesus. That to their shame and disgrace and discredit, the powers that be in Judea do not know about his coming. In fact, Herod has to ask, what does this mean? Wait, where does it say the Christ is to be born? And the priests who knew the answer from the prophecy still had to be told by these foreign pagans that the Christ child had been born to begin with. The signs and promises given were not recognized, but the coming of the Magi symbolizes the spread of the gospel to the whole world. Unfortunately, they do not arrive in time to see him in his manger, like every nativity scene has depicted him for the last 500 years. More importantly, they find Jesus, a boy of about two, at the house in Jerusalem. Think of the incredibleness of this image that is generally lost on us in this season. Out there in the culture where the mythology still persists, even in Christian churches, that the Holy Family were poor and impoverished refugees and nobody wanted them at the Motel 6, everything about the biblical text tells us the opposite. Joseph and his family are descendants of David, they go down to Jerusalem for the census to make sure that they lay claim to that ancestral land, those ancestral titles. They go to Bethlehem because that's where all the property that belonged to Jesse, the father of David, was. The ancestral estate of the family is there. For Jesus to be born on the property is pivotal to prove that he is the heir, rightfully and legally, one of the males of the line of David. When they don't let them in the house because every cousin showed up or because they don't want the child that they know is not Joseph born there, they go out to the barn out back and make sure that the boy is born on the property. And now, two years hence, back in Jerusalem from Nazareth, where are they? In a house, in a house that the family owns, in a house where Jesus can be seen and received properly. And the Magi come as ambassadors from afar bringing their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. All of this indicative 
of the greatness of the monarchy and of Jesus' kingship. All of it symbolic of his role in the future or his role now even as prophet, priest, and king. This is the light that shines in the darkness of a world that did not know him then and did not receive him, and even now, a world that does not know him. A world that where his name is known today is known under the misconceptions and fantasies that are politically charged by the contemporary culture. Or worse yet, pagans and idolaters who reject him completely and have lumped the world into yet another era, an epoch of darkness, when people don't know which way is up or what gender they are, when people don't know right from wrong or their own identity, where their entire personal identity is tied up in sexuality and perversions and things that deviate from the word and will of God. Imagine your entire existence, not just the things you fail at, not just the sin and the weakness that we all have leading us astray, but to wrap up your entire existence in that sinful fame, hiding in the darkness under the cover of night, rejecting God and his light. Because nothing really changes in that respect. In the first century, Christ arrives to a world that is his in every sense of the term. He created it, as we said in the creed, through whom all things were made. There is nothing made that is not made by Christ as God Almighty now made flesh. He comes into a world that rejects him then. He comes to a world that rejects him now. In fact, everywhere that God arrives into his creation, he finds himself rejected and despised by it. It is the nature of sin and our rebellion against him that no matter where and when he arrives, the remnant of the faithful is few and far between, always a minority within a minority within a minority, an invisible body of believers inside a visible one, inside some pretense to one, a horse inside of a horse inside of a horse in the city of Troy. Now oh, that wasn't a biblical reference. What happens when I get lost? No matter when he arrives in the world or whatever form, he arrives as one that is not recognized by the darkness of the world, but always as one whose light pierces the darkness. When he comes to his people, born in a stable and laid in a manger, when he arrives in that time and nobody is expecting his coming, he makes sure he still gets a proper welcome on the property, in the barn, greeted by the animals that he has made that in their own way are better than us, not led astray in the way that we are. And now, living in the house, a boy of two, his first ambassadors on earth, arrive from afar to pay homage to the true and rightful king. He makes sure that he is recognized, that he is known, that he is paid tribute to, that all the things happen properly despite the ignorance of everyone in the kingdom of Judea. These foreigners come from afar, from this seed planted so long before. And why not? This is how he continues to enter. From that promise he gave our ancestors in the Garden of Eden, that he would come in the flesh, a descendant of the woman, to crush the head of the serpent. God is continually following where he has planted those seeds, arriving into his creation to act, as he has promised to, to those who are called to believe it. To bring Noah through the flood, and Abraham out of Ur, and the people into Egypt, and then out of Egypt, into the wilderness, and then out of the wilderness, to deliver them into the promised land, into Babylon and out of Babylon. Everywhere he keeps appearing to that small remnant within a remnant within a group that believe in him. And he does it again. He does it at Christmas and Nativity. Every instant of creation, he is doing it by his incarnation. And he's doing it again right now. He will enter into the bread and wine on the altar, the body and blood of him born in the stable and laid in a manger, laid out for us to redeem us from our sin. From that promise that he gave to Adam and Eve in the garden to tonight at this moment soon to come, now even, here he enters into the darkness with his light to bring light to the darkness and lead us away to the promised land. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>